Okay, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. That's, that's where we're at. By the way, I did not really much new except the title. There is a, there is a sheet here. Many of you have that sheet. You may have lost it. I just updated it just a little bit yesterday. You may look at it and say, well, there's nothing new. There is, but you'd hardly notice it. So if you didn't get one of the sheets for the book of Corinthians, it's right here. Help yourself. There's also some back there. Uh, but you're not going to miss anything uh, today if you don't have it. We're going to go right into 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're all the way up to chapter 4. And... Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to read it with my Bible right there so that you know that it comes from the Word. And they're graciously putting it right up there as well. And uh, they're doing that in the NLT, the New Living Translation, because uh, that's what I'm preaching from. Chapter 4, and we're still in, we're out of the introduction, and we're down into the first part, which is Paul correcting the things that were sin within the church. Just remember we answered the issue can a church have sin in it? I've never seen a church that didn't. If you're perfect, you don't belong in this church. I, well, that's okay. We'll just leave that right there. <laughs> I don't know anybody who is perfect. So, uh, you know, he's trying to deal with all of us where we're at, and, and he's bringing us to maturity. So it says, look at Apollos and me. Remember, we were dealing with, in chapter 3, we were dealing with the fact that there was a, a race issue. Uh, I won't get into the politics of where that's at right now in America, but I think it's worse than the last eight years instead of better. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the whole issue of race, Corinthian church dealt with the race issue because the Jews and the Greeks were at odds with each other and both of them thought the other ones were the scum of the earth. You know, the Jews thought, we're the chosen of God. And the Greeks, they said, but we're the smartest, the brightest, we're the philosophers, we're the wise. The, I mean, we're just the best there is on the planet. And neither one of them could realize that God had put the goodness that he had in his character and nature in both Jews and Greeks. So black and white, Jews and Greeks, Oriental or Hispanic, uh, African American, say what you want, but God gave us all, you know, you, you go back to the blood and the blood is all the same. Are there cultural differences? Yeah, there are. But Paul immediately begins to deal with the race issue and, and the, the issue came up, there's always an instigating thing that comes up and was, was Apollos and Paul who were marvelous leaders. They weren't at war with each other, but the church had made it into an issue uh, of race. And some of them said, I follow only Paul. And others said, I follow only Apollos. And some were what I call hyper-spiritual. They said, well, I follow only Jesus. You know, there's pride there too. And the reality of it is Jesus is everything and we're nothing until he saved us and then we're everything. He gave us the value that we have. So he says, so look at Apollos and I, the Greek and the Jew, in, or as mere servants of Christ. He said, you look at us as leaders and if you think we think we're something special, he said, you're wrong. We're mere servants. Shared with you many times. That's the reason that uh, the liturgical pastors wear a collar because it, it's to symbolize the, the slave collar that was worn by so many when they were in slavery. That's what that white collar is for. Uh, so he says, we are your mere servants of Christ who wants us to love you. Uh, and he says, Christ has put us in charge of explaining God's mysteries. We spent some time on that two weeks ago, and so we won't stay there for long, but there may be a lot of things about God you think you don't know, but those are the mysteries that we're here to explain. And uh, so it goes on to say in, in the next uh, verse, Now a person who's put in charge as a manager must be faithful. 
One of the reasons I've gone back to exegetical preaching or verse by verse by verse by verse, I can't miss anything. Pretty tough to add stuff that doesn't belong there and to take away stuff that should be in there if you're preaching verse by verse by verse by verse. That makes sense? And so, uh, you know, he says, uh, now a person who's put in charge must, as a manager, must be faithful. I had the delightful privilege this week as the Bicentennial Committee meeting met and, and they charged me to go through and, and put together an updated list of the pastors who served here. And I looked at, that's an impressive list of people who served faithfully this church. 200 years. Starting with a man who started over 20 churches from Batavia down to Ripley including this church, on horseback as a circuit-riding preacher. In the dead of winter, summer, spring, fall, riding his horse while getting his sermon. Uh, you know, we're going to learn more about him and hear the history. And I have a, uh, an acquaintance who's an associate professor of history at JCC, and she put together about a 40-minute presentation on his life and what it was like for him to open those churches. And we're going to have her come and share with you, uh, the founder of this church, what his life was like riding horseback through all of these back channels. And at times, because the War of 1812 was on then, and you can see markers all over this area about the War of 1812. Just go down on Pecor Street, there's one. Uh, he had to avoid the war that was going on. At the same time, he was building this church. All oh, the history of this church is incredible. It's awesome. You have a great heritage, and we want you to know what that heritage is so you can value what God has given to you. Uh, so he says, but as for me, it matters. And give me about five minutes to explain what he means because he's not being arrogant, but it sounds like it. As for me, it matters very little how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. Now that sounds like I'm above you. That's not what he's saying at all. Sometimes we judge each other, and he's going into judging. He's saying, don't judge each other. It's not your job. <laughs> okay, listen to this now. It doesn't matter to me how I might be evaluated by you or by any human authority. And he goes on to say, I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. He said, as I go to evaluate what I'm doing, and I know exactly what he feels because there are some days when I think, okay, I think I'm doing a good job here. And there are other days when I think to myself, Gordon, there's so much more. That needs to be done. Why, you know, why isn't it being done? Why aren't you doing it? You're the under shepherd, and I, I beat up on myself. You ever beat up on yourself? It's not fun. We're not supposed to do that, you know. <laughs> uh, but that's where Paul was at. He said, "I don't even trust my own judgment about my ministry." That's what Paul was saying here. I don't even trust my own judgment on this point. And then he says, "Well, but my conscience is clear, but." And I can go through and I can say, well, I've done this. And I, you know, we can all justify what we've done or what we haven't done. That's a good word. We all try to justify, well, I've done this and I've done that. Mm -hmm. He said, I can justify it to make my conscience and say my conscience is clear. But then he says, but that doesn't prove I'm right. <sighs> Just because my conscience is clear doesn't mean I've done everything I should do. Just because I can justify doesn't mean I've done everything I can do. Paul struggled with that. The greatest apostle ever known. Goes on to say, It is the Lord himself who will examine me and he will decide. He'll decide, did I do what he called me to do? We are created by him, number one. 
Number two, as we're saved by him, he places his Holy Spirit down in us. And then we are expected to listen to the voice of his Holy Spirit inside as God talks to us every moment of every day. And God says, go this way. Now turn here. Go there. One of the devotions I read this week said, we'd much prefer that God gave us a road map and said, I'm going to start you here, I'm going to end you here, and here's every step of the way. God has never done that with anybody in the Bible. Never. And he's not going to do it with you and me. Why? Because I know me and I know my flesh. And he'd given me, here's the road map for every moment of every day of your life. I'd have gone off and said, I got this, God. I can handle this. I'm all right, God. Just sit down, God. I can take care of this. God doesn't want us to take off on our own. He wants us to listen to his voice every moment of every day. There's correction, there's instruction in righteousness that the men and women of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, that we may have the ability to hear God's voice and live it out every day. And the thing that we need to learn to do is to be obedient to that voice. Number one, hear it. And number two, when you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, say, yes, Lord, I'll do that. I'll do that. And they know his, his voice usually comes in what I call divine nudges. And it's like, go in this direction. Go in that direction. And you know how you learn to hear the voice of, of the Holy Spirit? Follow the nudges. Sometimes you'll be wrong. It's okay. God loves you anyway. Have you ever seen a baby that didn't stumble when they learned to walk? No. As we learn to walk in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, we'll stumble, we'll make mistakes. God loves us anyway. And by the way, we're to love each other anyway. In spite of us. (laughs) Sometimes we want to love people because of them. They're awesome. They're this, they're that. God says, no, you love them in spite of them, just like I'm asking them to love you. So, uh, interesting. He said, it is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. Next verse he says, uh, you ready to go on to the next one or not? Okay. Okay. Uh, So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time. And he goes on to explain, ahead of time means before I return. Don't make judgments. Oh, man, do we find that easy or what? Well, I know that they're here on the road of life because they don't do this and they don't do that and I don't think they don't handle this right and that right and I'm going to judge them. God says... As I learned from my son John, none ya, none ya business, <laughs> none ya business. It's God who judges His creation, and we see things, and sometimes we interpret them right, and sometimes we don't. But either way, God says, "Not up to us to judge." God will take care of How many of you think God's smart enough to handle judging all of us on the planet in the, all of history? Yeah. I don't know what God put in, in your heart to do, but He does. You know? Simple illustration that uh, for those who are in the process of becoming born again, and remember it was Jesus who used the phrase born again, in John chapter 3. And uh, he talked about the fact, he said, you must be born again. You were born of the flesh. You had a natural birth. But he said, you're going to get into heaven. You must be born again by the Spirit of God. Now, I've never had this, I think it's a privilege, but in Genesis it was a curse, delivering a child. Having that gestation period take care of, Uh, take place inside of me. Never had that. So I'm speaking out of the side of my mouth because I don't know, but 
I can tell you, I watch a lot of women, and they get to the, like the eighth month or the eight and a half, and the doctor isn't sure is it nine and a half or eight and a half, and they want to have it now, and they're sure, and it's you know a, a month later, the baby still hasn't come, and they're going, get this child out of me, you know. Uh, spiritual children are born the same way. We look at some people and say, well, they're not born again yet. They may very well be in the womb. In the process of being born, and the last thing they need is you and me to judge them. They, well, she did this, and he did that, and I, they believe this, and they... Hang on. God is doing a work in them, and God is doing a work in you, and it's up to God to judge where he's at with all of us. That's just what Paul is saying. You know, it's, it's really up to God. He made us. And so he says, don't make any judgments about anyone ahead of time. And then he says, before the Lord returns. We know, and this verse reminds us, Jesus is coming back again. And according to the fact that he said certain prophecies had to be fulfilled before he comes back, they're all, they're all fulfilled. There's no reason he can't come back now. I don't know whether it'll be 100 days or whether it'll be 100 years. I don't know, but I know the prophecies are fulfilled. And he could come at any time. And so... He is, they're reminding us, the Holy Spirit is reminding us through Paul, uh, don't make judgments before the Lord returns. In other words, we're all going to stand together in front of the Bema seat judgment of God as believers. And we'll hear God say, first of all, if you're in the Bema seat judgment, then you're already saved. The great white throne judgment in Revelation is for those who weren't saved. So if you're standing in the Bema seat, you can say, Hallelujah, I made it. Uh, but at that point, God's going to, you know, to evaluate our faithfulness. And uh, we've already gone through some of that in 1 Corinthians 1 through 3. So it says, uh, For he will bring our darkest secrets to life to light, excuse me, and will reveal our private motives. Ow. We have a sense that if we just do things right, people won't know what our motives are. They don't know why we do what we do right. They just look at us and say, well, boy, they do right things. God judges the motives. Why did you do what you did? Did you do it to honor him? Did you do it because the people were in need and you were reaching out to minister to them? Or did you do it for glory, for self-aggrandizement? Did you do it for money? Did you, why did you do it? And he says, in the end, only God will be able to say, I know their motives and I know why they did it. And that which was done listening to the Holy Spirit for the right motives, God will bless. And as we read in the previous chapter, there will be gold, silver, and precious stone. That's the quality of those works. Uh, and for those we did with wrong motives, we're still saved, 1 Corinthians 3 says, but those works will be burnt up as wood, hay, and stubble. So we won't take them into eternity. They'll be burnt up. So there... And, Aren't you glad that there's a point where God's going to clean out all the junk? Some I don't even know what's junk and what isn't. You know, as, as Don is, is uh, trying to sort out and clean and pack stuff to go, and he's having a hard time, he told me, deciding, what, do I take this? Do I, do I need that there? Do I junk this? Do I give that away? What do I do with this and that? I got a whole second floor of that I got to go through, you know. First floor is pretty good. I know where it's going someday, but uh, second floor. We, as believers, we don't know. We think this stuff is good and this isn't, but we're human. We don't know. God will decide and he will take everything that was wrong or, or improper and he'll burn it up and you will never have to look at it again for all of eternity. Is that awesome or what? 
You won't have to spend eternity saying, oh, Lord, I really messed up here. Yes, that's gone. It's burned up. It's gone. I will never ask you to look at it again for all of eternity. What you did right and what you did by listening to, to the Holy Spirit, uh, you know, I'm going to reward you for all of eternity with that. And so that's what he's saying. For he will bring our deepest, darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives that nobody else knows and we may not even know fully. And then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. If you're like me, and I assume probably to some extent you are, you want the praises of people. You want people to like you. You want people to think, did a good job. Come on, fess up. How many of you are like that? None of you. Okay, I'm sorry I'm that way. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I think there, there's a sense that all of us are that way. God is saying, and the Apostle Paul is saying, doesn't matter what people think. He just said that a couple verses up. Doesn't matter what I think, Gordon, and it doesn't matter what you think, either about what we're doing or what others. God is the judge, and he will decide, should I be praised for that? And there'll be lots of things that God will praise you for, and you'll think, Really, God? You're going to praise me for that? That just didn't seem like a big deal to me when I did it. And God said, no, I'm going to praise you for that. And other stuff, he thought, that was really good of me, God. And God said, no, that's works of the flesh. Burn that up. <laughs> so God's going to take care of that. Then God will give to each one the praise that is due. Now he says in verse 6, Dear brothers and sisters, I have used... Apollos and myself to illustrate what I've been saying. He says, if you've been paying attention to what I've quoted from the scriptures, you won't be proud of one of your leaders over uh, at the expense of another leader. He said, you won't honor one above another because they're all the leaders of God. Uh, and they're all uh, imperfect and they all miss God in some places, and they all find God in some places. Does that make sense? So he says, you won't be proud of your lead, one leader at the expense of another. For what gives you the right to make such a judgment? What do you have that God hasn't given to you? Hmm. And if everything you have is a gift from God... Why boast as though it were not a gift? In other words, you produced this thing. I deserve pride because and honor because I produced this. And God says, no, everything you have is a gift from me. Every Sunday when I bring the offerings, I take the offerings and I pray over them and I set them on the altar of the Lord, I say the same thing, God, you provided for us this week. Thank you, Lord. We ate this week because you gave to us. We had clothing this week. We had protection this week from accidents. We had this and that and the other blessing, God, because you provided for us. You created us. You love us. You provide for us. You sustain us. And you're day by day sanctifying us, making us holy. And so, uh, you know, he says there isn't anything we have that didn't come from the Lord. But he says this was the Corinthians' attitude. You think you've already, you already have everything you need. You think you are already rich. You have begun to reign in God's kingdom without us, the apostles. I wish you really were reigning already, for then we would be reigning with you. But instead, he says, sometimes I think God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war at the end of the victor's parade. In other words, when the, when the conquering king comes through, he takes all of the army of the enemy he's defeated and he puts them on parade and he strips them down to nothing. He takes all their weapons, strips them down to just a little bit of clothing and makes them march as humiliated, uh, you know, conquered people. And Paul says, sometimes as an apostle I feel that way. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. Bless you. Uh, he had all the Bible goes on to say what he went through. And you understand why he's saying that. He went through a ton of stuff as an apostle. Uh, sometimes you and I feel like we're go, going through stuff. 
to use the vernacular, we ain't got a clue. We certainly haven't been through what the Apostle Paul has been through. We certainly haven't been through what uh, the martyrs in North Korea and China and Russia during the Cold War and other communist countries, we haven't got a clue what they've been through. Nobody's ever imprisoned us for praying in the name of Jesus. And so he's saying that's up to God to, to decide that. And he said, we're not reigning yet. And uh, so he said, but you have become, or we have become a spectacle to the entire world and to the people uh, and angels alike. So he says, our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools. More and more in today's American culture, Christians are looking like fools. You all see that? I mean, if you don't see it, you ain't looking. More and more Christians are made to look like fools. He says, my dedication to Christ has made me look like a fool. But you claim to be so wise, Corinthian church, in Christ, and we are so weak. But you were so powerful, you think, in other words. You feel honored, but we are ridiculed. And even now we go hungry and thirsty and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. And we're often beaten and have no home. And we work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. Paul was a tent maker. And uh, uh, so there was some debate between the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. Should ministers be paid or shouldn't they be paid? And God says, it's up to me. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll do what needs to be done. But Paul was, excuse me, taught by God to be a, a tent maker and worked with his hands repeatedly. Uh, and he said, we bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. I, that hurts, folks. Even here, there have been things that were said about me that were evil, corrupt, and immoral, and there wasn't a shred of truth. And some of you have been through the same thing. There wasn't a shred of truth in it. But boy, some people can just sling the stuff. And they don't have a clue. And God says, don't judge. Don't receive gossip from somebody else about anybody in the church or outside of the church, and spread it as if it were truth. What did we read? What's the word for today? Speaking the truth in love. We're to grow up into the image and the character of Christ. Don't share gossip. People are desperately hurt by lies and gossip where there's not a shred of truth, but people don't have the ability to sort out, is it true or is it not true? You let the Holy Spirit take you there. Believe me, God knows how to deal with His people so that if somebody is wrong in their actions, never mind you dealing with it. God will deal with it. Hmm. Okay. We're all the way down to, uh, you know, we appeal gently when evil things are said about us, yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash, right up to the present moment. It's the Apostle Paul. I mean, he's in prison for what? Preaching the gospel. Okay. Not at this particular moment, but he's been in prison several times. And, uh, you know, so he says, I'm not writing these things to you to shame you, but to warn you as beloved children. Even if you had 10,000 others to teach you, he said, there's thousands of Bible teachers, but there's only one apostle who brought you to life in Christ. There's only one who shared the gospel with you the first time. And you were saved through that apostle sharing with you or that believer. He said, that's a spiritual father. You can have thousands of Bible teachers. 
I'm a Bible teacher, but I didn't bring most of you to Christ. You know, somebody else brought you to Christ. That's your spiritual father. Paul says, I'm your spiritual father. There's a difference between a Bible teacher who matures you and a spiritual father who birthed you. We'll finish this short passage here, and we'll end with that for the day. Even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you, so I urge you to imitate me, my life. urge you, I'm going to stop there, uh, to, to imitate my life. Powerful stuff, folks. God was trying to build the Corinthian church. Take them from a point of immaturity to a point of maturity. Every church has points of maturity and immaturity. Every believer has points of maturity and immaturity. And what God is saying through the book of 1 Corinthians is, let me mature you. Let me grow you up into my image, not mine, his image, the image of Christ. Let me grow you up. He's getting us ready to rule with him for all of eternity. Amen? Amen. Praise God.